Hello and good morning everyone. Welcome to our next seminar in our Australian Geometric PD seminar series. Um, quite exciting today. We've, we've gone international. We're pleased to have uh, Tenkai Lee from Massachusetts Institute of Technology with us. Um, he's going to speak to us on uh, the cylindrical estimates in the mean curvature flow. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Also, thanks for having me. Yeah, hopefully sometime I can visit Australia in person again. Today, I'm going to talk about the cylindrical estimate proven by Chris King and Sinatrawi. And this can be viewed as the, yeah, the second step after the convexity estimate to understand the more delicate information about the singularity of two convex mean curvature flow. So let me start from the statement that we have seen in the previous two talks, which is the convexity estimate proven by, again, Wissing and Centrali. Centrali. Yeah. So the setting is that we have a, yeah, and I, I believe I don't have to emphasize, if you have any questions, please, Feel free to stop me anytime. Okay. So the setting is that we have a closed mean convex hypersurface. Okay. And we assume the dimension is at least two, otherwise it will be meaningless. And we will let MT to be the mean curvature flow starting from this closed hypersurface. Yep. And we know that if we are given a closed hypersurface, then we have existence and uniqueness for the mean curvature flow equation. For some time, P. Okay. Then the conclusion is that given any positive number eta, we can find a constant that only depends on the initial data and this small constant such that the smallest eigenvalue in fact is not very small. Okay. okay so this is the statement for the convexity estimate. So let me quickly give two remarks. The first one is that uh, Brown White used the method of geometry major theory to prove the same statement, but he can prove this for a level set flow, which can be sort of as a weak formulation for mean curvature flow. Okay. But yeah, recall from the previous two talks, uh, Whisking and Sinatrali used the purely PD method. So they are quite different, but the same result. And the second remark is that we have seen this estimate will imply that if we blow up the flow near a singularity, so we divide it edge on both sides, then because of curvature blow up, so in the singularity model, we will see that the blow up will be uh, convex. So lambda one will be non-negative. Okay? So this tells us that any blow up model will be convex. Okay? Then the next step, so next step of Whisking and Sinatrawi is to try to find a neck. So because they want to do surgery, okay, so if you have a neck, so the neck, something like this, then if we have this kind of region when we are close to the single time, then hopefully we can get, cut out this region and put two cap here do this kind of surgery at the neck region. Okay. But it turns out that this is not true if we only deal with the mean convex hypersurface. So let me draw some pictures to, to, to talk about this. So let me draw some possible situations in the surface case. So if you have a mean convex surface, then there are some possible situations. The first one is the, the, the dumbbell model in our mind. So you have two balls whose radii are very large comparing to 
the radius of the middle neck, then along the main curvature flow, finally it will pinch together, something like this. Okay? So if we look at the region at this singularity, then right before, before the singularity is very close to the evolution of a shrinking round cylinder. Okay? So this is a nice neck. So this is the region we want to find at the end if we want to do the surgery. And another situation is that it turns out that our flow is just a, just a strictly convex body. It's a strict, strictly convex. Then this is also good because by Whisking's first theorem, we know that any strictly convex closed hypersurface will shrink to a long point. So also yeah, we know the information before the singularity, so it's good. Then there's another situation when there's also a dumbbell, but the radius of the two balls are not comparable, but the smaller ball, it has its radius very close to the, to the radius of the neck. In this situation, if we run the mean curvature flow, then finally it will develop a cusp type singularity. Okay, so this is a cusp. Okay. If you blow up at this point using the maximum curvature along the time, then we will fi finally see that the blow up will be a translating solitum. Okay, so you can, in a two uh, curve case, it will correspond to the Green Reaper we, we saw before. But in the higher dimensional, there's also a strictly convex translating soliton. Okay. So it turns out that this is not a, a nice neck as we saw here. Okay. So this tells us that even in the surface case, if we only put the mean, co mean convexity in the assumption, then it's not always true that other than the strictly convex region, we will always see a neck. Okay. And um, another best situation is in the higher dimensional case. So in, we know that the singularity models are convex. So it's possible that there will be some R2 times S1. So this is someone call it a bubble sheet singularity or more worst R3 cross, cross S1 or any generalized cylinder whose uh, Euclidean factor is now one. Okay, so we have many more singularity models in general. Okay, so our or original goal is to say that if the singularity model is not strictly convex, then we can find an egg. So this is definitely not true. We need more assumptions about the original hypersurface and the shape of the singularity. Okay. So let me write out a statement. Is the cylindrical estimate by Whistling and Sinatrobi? Okay. So the setting is we have an initial hypersurface, which is a close two convex, two convex hypersurface. Okay, and now we we'll assume that this way. Even space. And now we we'll assume that dimension is at least three. So later we'll see some results that by this dimension restriction is necessary, at least in this formulation. Okay. And here, two convex means that the, the sum of the smallest two principal curvatures is now negative. Okay. So this is definitely stronger than the mean convexity. Yeah, two convexity will imply mean convexity in general. Okay. Then starting from this closed hypersurface, we have the mean curvature flow. Okay. 
Okay. Then the statement of the cylindrical estimate is as follows. We are given any positive number. Then we can find a constant that only depends on our initial hypersurface and this small positive eta, such that the following statement is true. So if we had our smallest uh, principal curvature is very small comparing to the, to the main curvature, then at this point, the other larger principal curvatures is in fact also very close to each other. Okay, so here CN is just some dimensional constant. So it's just a constant depending on, depending on dimension. Okay, so what does this, does this mean? So it means that if your uh, first smallest uh, principal curvature is very small, which means that we are not in uh, this situation. Okay, so this is a stri strictly convex. We have a positive lower bound for the for each eigen value, and we are also not in this situation. So not in this situation. Also not in this situation because at the end it will. This part is very close to a, a uniformly convex cusp. Okay, so this estimate tells us that if we're not in this good situation, also not in this bad situation, then we will have a neck. Okay, because. This tells us that the remaining uh, lambda two to lambda m, the other eigenvalues, they are very close to each other comparing to the to the main curvature. Okay, so this is the statement of the main result we want to look at today. Okay. And as in the convexity estimate, if we have this estimate and we uh, we blow up the the singularity at this point, so we divided the curvature on the both sides of this inequality, we'll see that finally in the model, uh, other than the first principal curvature, the other principal curvature will be the same. So it's just a cylinder. Okay. So far, any questions about the statement? Okay. So we are going to use the very similar method as in the previous two talks. So we will not deal with this principal curvature directly because in general, they are not smooth functions. Okay, so we'll look at the, this function we call F sigma eta, which is divide, defined by this portion. Let me write it down and I will explain why we want to look at this ratio. Okay. One, Sigma positive. Okay. So let uh, in the previous two talks we look at some similar ratios, but the constant here are different. Okay. And the goal we want to prove at the end is to show that for small enough eta, so not eta, sigma. So given any eta, we can find small enough eta. Sigma such that this function is uniformly bounded. Okay. And I claim that this claim will imply the cylindrical estimate. I mean, for you, theorem one. This claim will imply theorem one. Okay. The reason is so the, the vague idea is that. This difference, you can view it really as the trace-free part of the second fundamental form for the part other than the smallest eigenvalue. Okay, so it's the vague idea. And this can be made rigorous by the following algebraic identity. So if you, calculate this quantity rigorously, then this is equal to
the difference between any higher principal curvatures plus something related to lambda one. Okay, so if we, yeah, so this is just an edge ray expression. So I will not do it here. Okay, but if we know this fact, then, so first we have the convexity estimate, which tells us that uh, lambda one is always not very small. And in the cylindrical estimate, we know that lambda one is also not very big. Okay, so we have an upper bound and lower bound for lambda one. Okay, so with these assumptions, so this part we can just, they, do, they only have small contribution. So if we know that this part is very small comparing to the mean curvature vector, which is, which is exactly this estimate, then we will know that the difference of any other larger principal curvatures will be small, which is the statement of the cylindrical estimate. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so the remaining task is to use PDE to show this estimate. Okay, and during the proof, you will see many similar steps that we have seen in the previous two talks. So I will skip some of them. Okay, but feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Okay, so now I want to look at a function f. So I will just denote f sigma eta by f if. Uh, the constant sigma and eta are fixed. And I will denote f plus by the non negative part of f. Okay? So if f is negative, this function is just zero. And if it's positive, then it's just f. Okay? So the first thing we want to look at is the evolution equation for the P LP norm of this function. Okay. And later we will quickly explain how we want to look at the integral expression in, instead of just the point wise bound. Okay, so let me first write it down. Okay. And I will not prove it because if you replace the f plus here with the one that we use in the convexity estimate, which is, I think we use g to denote the the difference of a square and h square, then you will see you get the exactly same expression for the evolution equation. That's because the point wide is point wide evolution equation for f plus and g plus are the same. Because at this part we haven't used any spatial property about this cylindrical quotient. Let me finish it. Okay. So this is the evolution equation we will use later, okay? And the reason why I want to look at the integral expression, we have seen this before, but let me stress this again. This is because the ordinary maximum principle argument cannot give us the point-wise bound directly because yeah, the evolution equation look like this, okay? So this is the linear gradient term, which is okay. So this is, a, this is not a bad term. And here we have some non-positive term, which is also very good. So it's negative. It's also, also okay. This is a non-positive term. But the final term, we have this curvature here, which is blowing up when we when we are close to a singular time, okay? So we cannot use the maximum principle directly to, to get that F is uniformly bounded along the flow, okay? So the, the derivation of this point-wise evolution equation and this integral evolution equation, they are the same as in the previous two talks. So I will not do that, okay? But I will, let me spend some time explaining why this term, so this term, so first it's not hurting because there's a minus sign, but last time we have seen that this will give us some additional good terms. 
So it turns out that this is bounded by some red edge term. So this will give, give us more room to handle some positive bad term later. Okay. So let me spend some time talking about this estimate, why this is true, because this estimate plays, plays a role in Christine's first paper and Christine's and Charles' second paper and this surgery paper in many places. So I think I can, it's worth spending some time explaining why this is true. Yeah. And uh, I think Professor Benju has mentioned that this is one of the reasons why this is true is because the Kodazi equation. Okay. So let's see why um, that plays a rule. Okay. So let me write it in this way. So I will use lowercase a to denote the component of the second fundamental form. Okay. So this is just the local expression of this norm of this tensor, three tensor, okay? And we, we can write this as the following form. Let me write it down first, and then I will explain how you want to write it in this way. So we try to decompose this tensor so that at the end, the remaining part will give us some good information. Okay. Okay, so first, this uh, this equality is just, yeah, we didn't do anything. So this part will cancel and this part will give it as a uh, original term, okay? And the reason why we want to do this is because uh, this part and this part they are orthogonal because if you look at the inner product of this part and this part, then they are just their inner product is just zero because the product of this one and this one they are the same. It's direct direct uh, commutation, and the product of this part and this part so they are cancelled because we just switch i and k. So this part and this part are orthogonal. And this part and the first part are also orthogonal because the Kodazi equation, okay? Because this is also equals to KIL, okay? So this pairing with this, this term and this term, they are the same, okay? okay so we have, we have seen that these two parts, they are orthogonal. So this is equal to, okay? Let me just copy it. This and this. So this is equal to square plus. Okay. Then we'll look at this part. Okay, so this is greater than equal to this part. So when calculating this part, let me choose a spatial local orthogonal frame. So we choose the first duration to be the duration of grad edge, okay? Then this part is just equal to, okay, you know, and let me see, uh, let me write it in this way. So we just have to look at the, the second component, one edge, A2, two, two, minus, Okay, so we just look at um, one term in this summation, okay? And grad two edge is zero okay, by our choice of the uh, local normal frame. So this part is equal to grad edge square times, uh, oh sorry, because I put a summation here, so let me, let me write it this way. Uh, 1KL and K1L. Okay. So this is still part of the summation. So this inquiry is still true. And if K is just one, then these two terms are just the same. So we don't have that term. And if K is not one, then this part 
just vanishes. Okay, so it turns out that this sum is just given by a k l square, which is the norm of the second binomial form. Okay, and we know that the, the in for any hybrid surface, second binomial form is always uh, some multiple of the h square. It should be n here. Okay, by the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. So we get the yeah, this one. So this is why this term is not only not harmful, but also helping us in the estimate. So far, any questions? Yep. Yeah. If no, then so the only part we have to take care of much is the last term. So this final term is a, it comes from this term. Okay. So we will again use a one guy type inequality to deal with this term. And again, I will not do the calculation because it's very similar, but Later we will see that there are some differences, okay, but this part is similar. So this harmful term, in fact, it can be bounded by the other term, which we can bound use some good term we are seeing in the evolution equation. Okay, so this gradient term and the grade edge term we have just seen that coming from the, yeah, this good term of the, that spatial three tensor. Okay. Um, but this time we have, we haven't seen it in our uh, good terms. So we have this three good terms. Okay. So we want to use these terms to deal with these three terms. Okay. So this is okay, this is okay, but for this, we don't have any thing to find it so far. Okay, so we have to deal with it. Once this is done, then we can finally derive the a very similar LP bound in the convexity estimate. So the statement is as follows: for large enough P and small enough sigma, we can find some constant yeah, by the way, if I just write C and didn't talk about any dependence, I always mean it depends on the initial data and some given eta, uh, so the initial manifold and the given eta only. Okay. Okay. So for larger number P and small number eta, sigma. We can find a fixed constant k such that this LP norm it is almost decreasing up to a linear term. That's key. So this is the uh, the first difference we see from the convexity estimate. In a convexity estimate, we don't have this term. So the LP norm is just decreasing. Okay. But here we need a linear term because of this additional term. Okay. But at the end, we will see that it doesn't, this additional term doesn't make any difference in the Stamparka iteration. Okay. So let's look at this. So the only thing we have to do is this term because only this time we cannot cancel it using our good negative terms, okay? So first, the expression of this F, so let me remind you again, this is the difference of A squared and some constant times H squared, which is the trace-free part of the cylindrical component. Okay. This part is bounded by N times H sigma. And th this is because in our two convex two, two convexity settings, 
a squared is also bounded by some constant time h squared because the largest eigen value is bounded by this because the sum of lambda one and lambda two is now negative okay and when n is at least three this is not over the mean culture scalar okay. so this is one part why we need the the dimension is at least three you can also see in the description of the cylindrical estimate if n is two then we have nothing to do in fact so it's an, another reason why we need the dimension is at least three okay anyway yeah okay, so we have this estimate so which will imp in, imply this rough estimate okay so with this the term we want to bound which is this term by Young's inequality. So I don't want to deal with those uh, exponents here. So let me just write it in this way. So we can bond it by the H2FP plus some, some exponent times H minus sigma PFP. Okay. If we write it in this way, then this part, this, we can use this to bond it by some concept. So it's just the integral of some constant. So finally, we'll get some, let yeah, me write down the exact exponent one here. So here is the place where the volume appears okay, because finally we are integrating over some constant. Okay. So far, any questions? So this part is very similar in the convexity case. Okay, so other than this additional term. Okay, but you, you can feel that this is not a big deal because the volume of the uh, volume of the hybrid surface is decreasing along the mean curvature flow. So this is also can be bounded by some constant depending on M not only. Okay. So at the end we can deal with so after arrangement so we choose c small enough and put it to the yeah stop so based on the exponent we choose here so we just move this to the other side okay so this is bounded by okay so now you can see some very similar terms in there Convexity estimate. Okay, so if we, in a convexity estimate, we just stop here. Okay, but here we have an additional term coming from the volume. So here, let me just change mt to m naught because the volume of mt is bounded by the volume of m naught. Okay, well, in you know, a mean curvature flow. Okay. okay, so now we put this term back to the Back to the evolution equation, this one. Let me copy it. Okay. okay. So we put, uh, okay. let me see how, how I formulate it. Okay. So in the first, for the first two terms, I don't do anything. And for the third term, we use the Estimate we proved here. Okay, so this is a this this term is helping us. So we just write it in this way. This C P C. Okay, so this is the third term, and the final term is how we just estimate here. So this is. Plus C. No, I should, I should just cut that. Yeah. Almost done. Sorry. And you can see that 
all the terms here, they can just bound it by the good terms in front of them. Times the value. Okay, so let me put them together to give you an idea why we can, at the end, choose some good constant P and beta so that other than the constant depending on the volume of n naught, the other terms will be okay. okay. So we collect the term with a gradient of f, which is plus, okay. And we have the grad edge term, which is plus this beta t. Okay, and this is a grad edge term. And finally, we have the, some constant times. And at the end, I, I find that the constant is not very important. So. Uh, of course, it depends on p and sigma, but at the end, it's not very important. Okay, so this is all we get. And you can see here, we can now choose p large enough and beta small enough such that both of these terms are non positive. Okay, so they are both less than or equal to zero. So we get the, the time derivative of this LP norm is bounded by a constant which is what we claim in the corollary, okay? Integrated will give us the inequality, okay? So, so the LP norm is almost decreasing up to a constant term, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. okay, so now we are going to use the Stan Parker equation to show that, uh, to show what? To show this function at the end, it is uniformly bounded. Okay, so let me recall the, the Stan Parker lemma. And remind you how this works. So the lemma says that if we have a, in a decreasing function, non-negative decreasing function. So it's an decreasing with the following decaying decaying rate. So for any H and K, we have this relation. For this constant. You see. Okay. For any yeah, H greater than K, we have this. So if this decaying rate is true, then it turns out that at the end, because this decaying rate is too strong, so at the end, this function will be vanishing. So for some large enough D, depending on all of this constant, okay. Okay, so, and the way we are going to apply this lemma is we will consider a function V, which depending on a chosen K by, okay, so starting from this, we will see many similar parts, okay. So at the end, we will see, the key inequality we will use is the same. Okay. Now we, we have the decreasing quantity is different. Okay, so we will keep doing this until then we reach the same key inequality. Okay. So we consider a function V, which is F minus case to the power P. Okay. And we look at the part where this function is positive. Dxt is 
positive. Okay. And at the end, the function one we are going to apply the lemma is the integral of this region. Okay. So if if finally we can show that the Stamparga iteration apply to this function, which means that so if this is true, this means that this is zero for large enough d, then it means that this function f is uniformly bounded by this d, okay? Because the region where this function is positive is empty, okay? So the remaining goal is to show this region is true for some for some constant, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so now we want to derive the equation for this D, okay, using this decreasing power. Here. Okay, so first we look at the evolution equation for the integral of this V. Okay, so V, v squared is just this. So F minus K to power two P. So the evolution equation will be very similar to the one we have for F. Let me repeat it here again. So here you can just apply, uh, let me see, the previous evolution equation to this setting. Let me copy them quickly. Minus yeah, I should. So this is the part we have seen before, and the bad part. And we will just look at the the gradient term. So here. So here we are not going to use the full power of those good terms, but just look at the gradient term. Okay. okay, so we just omit this term and this term, these two non-positive terms. Okay. And again, we will use the inequality by Jim Michael and Leon Simon. So the Michael Simon inequality. So we will set Q to be n over n minus two. So here we don't have to deal with the n equals two case because we already assume our dimension is at least three. Okay, so in this case, we have this inequality involving the mean curvature scalar. Because we want to use this gradient term. Okay. So we have to choose our uh, sigma small enough such that we can export uh, this term to the left hand side. And turns out that we can use this gradient term to get some higher LQ estimate. Okay, so we want to find K and eta such that this term is very small. Okay, and this is possible because because first this is bounded by, so in this set, A, K, T, our function is larger than K. So we have this inequality. Okay, so let me write it, write the original form of F out, which is, this trace free part of the cylindrical second fundamental form. P. H. Two and sigma. P. Okay. And what we're going to do is yeah, very similar to 
we have seen last time. We are going to combine these two terms, okay? So because we can write this as we absorb this H n to the denominator, so which is sigma prime, where sigma prime is just sigma plus number p. Okay, so just absorb this H n to the denominator, okay? So if our p is large enough, then we know that the previous decreasing property, almost decreasing property, is true for any sigma small enough and p large enough. Okay, so this property also applies to f sigma plus eta. Okay, so by by the corollary, this is bounded by. By this is oh yeah. Okay. So first we can replace this by by n. Okay. N is larger than this function is non negative. So this as an um, mt mt, and we use the almost decreasing decreasing property of this integral, which gives us m not sigma plus eta p plus c t, okay? But this is fine, okay? Because this is always bounded by some constant depending on m naught, okay? This is okay because just integral on m naught. The existence time of a mean convex mean curvature flow, the close mean convex mean curvature flow is always depending only on the initial manifold, okay? So finally, we see that almost decreasing property and decreasing property will give us the same conclusion. Okay, so we just have to take k large enough, then this this part will be very small, and we can put it to the left hand side and get what we want. So at the end, we will get this term is bounded by this term only, and put it here we will finally get the derivative of the L2 norm of the function we, are, we care about is bounded by, let me copy you again. So this is the, the original one given by the evolution equation. And here, combining this, this estimate, and Michael Simon's inequality, we see that this term is bounded by the L2 Q norm of this function B. Okay. So why any questions? So this is for a large enough to make this very small. Okay, so if, if there are no questions, then this is the key inequality we'll use in the sample characterization. So if you, for example, if you go to the paper of Whiskey and Sinchari, is the equation 4.7, okay? And if you go to Diverge nodes, I think we can find it somewhere. So we, based on this inequality, we can derive the remaining estimate in verbi term. Okay, so this, this inequality is exactly the same as we have seen in the convexity estimate. Okay, so if you want, I can write more. So based on this, so based on this inequality plus some LP interpolation, or holder or something we have seen exactly the same in the previous two lectures. We can derive two inequality, which is the L2 estimate of your function 
B where Q naught is some is number between one and two. And holding impossible imply the second second term is bounded by or are large enough. Okay. This is just yeah, not related to the main question flow, but just some um, LP inequality. Okay, then combining this, we'll finally get which one is KT, which is ready in this form. Which one is K? Okay, so this thing, so this is bounded by this, this is bounded by. For any k large enough and h greater than or equal to h, okay. And this is the inequality we want to prove in the Stamparker integration. So, yeah, so this is zero for large enough p. Okay. And we call that this will imply f sigma eta. It's uniformly bounded, which is all you want. Okay. Okay, so we have this is uniformly bounded, and it will imply when your smallest eigenvalue is very small, then the other eigenvalues will be very close to each other. Yeah, so that's all I want to say. Yeah. Thanks very much, Tenkai. Does anyone have any comments or questions for our speaker? Thank you. Yeah, in fact, I have one question to to those if if you have any ideas. Like before Huisting's first paper, is Stampakia's iterations used before? Does anyone know this? I'm interesting how Huisting. Yes, um, <laughs> he learned that from Klaus Ecker actually. From Klaus oh. Ecker's uh, PhD thesis was on capillary surfaces. And he'd used that technique in in the work he did there. So who's can learn it from him? Uh, I see. I, see. I, I think it was used quite widely in that area of PDE, particularly. Yeah. I see. I see. Oh, okay. I think uh, didn't uh, Gerhard Klaus Gerhard use it? Yeah, I was going to well? say Klaus Gerhard. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, Ecker, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I think in Ecker's they were both his students. So yeah. Yeah, but I think I I thought I read in Ecker's um maybe there's a paper on that he he refers to a previous paper of Gerhard from before sure. then that we no, got it from yeah 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 I see I see yeah because I I just noticed that Christine is very humble in his first paper but I found it very amazing to use this very complicated iteration I mean comparing to Hamilton's Ricci flow case. Uh, he need to do much more work in the mean capsule case. Yeah, so really. Yeah, it's just it's fortunate somehow that that uh, who's going to come from that particular, you know, part of PDE previously, mm -hmm. um, where that that technique was used quite a lot. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we've had a good question from the speaker. Uh, any any final comments or questions from the audience? That's great. Thanks, Tenko. All right. If not, let, let's uh, let's you. leave it there and let's thank our speaker again. Yeah. Thanks for coming earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'll stop recording there.